actually nothing to do with what we're talking about today. So today we're going to be talking about the Ionic app framework. And I wasn't able to write a whole talk, but I at least put a couple slides together. So there we go. Um, so Ionic app framework, thanks. Oh, this is me. I'm Matt Stauffer. I already introduced myself, but I'm the partner and technical director at Titan Co., which is a web development agency out of Chicago, Illinois, <coughs> although only one of us actually still live in Chicago at this point. The rest of us are spread around the US, but we still rep Chicago. Um, so Ionic is a front-end framework for creating mobile apps that is built on Cordova, which you might also know as uh, PhoneGap, um, Angular, so AngularJS, and SAS. Um, you don't always have to use all the pieces, but you're definitely always going to be using Cordova and Angular. Otherwise, you're not using Ionic. Um, so for starters, Cordova is a platform for building native mobile applications using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So what Cordova allows you to do, it started as uh, PhoneGap back in the day, but it's now called Cordova, is use web um, technologies and web frameworks to build apps that will end up on one of these platforms. So you're most familiar with Android, Blackberry, iOS, but you've got all these different options. Qt, which is multi-platform, OSX, um, FireOS, and all these different options. So you build one singular app based on web technologies, and then Cordova takes the responsibility of both building out to all these other spaces, and then also it gives you JavaScript um, access to all these different plugins. So you can get battery status in the phone, you can get motion sensors on the phone, you can get file transfers, geolocations. It builds JavaScript plugins for every single one of those different platforms and gives you access to them via one unified inter interface, and then it builds the plugins out every time you do a deploy. So PhoneGap is most well known. Back in 2009, a company called Nitobi, I assume that's how it's pronounced, um, they created it at a dev meetup. Um, and then it was purchased by Adobe in 2011, and um, Adobe donated it to make it open source, and they gave it to Apache. And because of the difference between the interests of an application or a company like Adobe and open source, they had to rename it. So the open source version, which is the core, is Cordova, and then Adobe has like a branded version of that called PhoneGap. Um, so it's a distribution not exactly the same, but kind of like WebKit Safari. So WebKit is open source, and then Safari, Chrome, all these other browsers are all built on WebKit. So as you can expect, PhoneGap has some things that Cordova doesn't, but they're all things that make it integrate better with the Adobe infrastructure. Adobe's build tools, Adobe's uh, you know, development opportunities, all that kind of stuff. So Cordova, especially when you're working in this open source world, if you're not working with a specifically Adobe-based tool, you're probably going to be working with something on Cordova. So Ionic is a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit like Twitter Bootstrap, just to get us, get us in the frame of mind. So Ionic takes Cordova, and it puts some really nice, easy command line based wrappers around Cordova to make it easier to do a few things so that you don't have to learn all of Cordova in order to do your builds and your emulation. And then it stacks SAS and Angular on top of it. And you can ignore the SAS. You can just write straight CSS and throw out all the SAS files. But everything in Ionic is predicated around these SAS files, and your life is going to be a lot better if you use it. And then AngularJS is one of the biggest benefits of Ionic is, is putting all of the page building capabilities of AngularJS and all these directives that it delivers, and I'll tell you more about those in a minute, um, in your hands in a way that only AngularJS could do or a similar, similar framework. So when you're doing development based on Cordova or PhoneGap, you're going to get some huge benefits, but you're also going to have some detriments. So the pros are faster development because you're working in web-based technologies, which means you have, you know, there's less complexity to what you're building. Um, but also, you're, you're building a single app and it's going to work on all these platforms, theoretically. So it's cross-platform out the box, which makes everything faster. You don't build the iOS app, and then two years later build the Android app, and, app, and then two years later build the Fire OS app. You build one app, and then you do a little bit of tweaking on each different platform using media queries or you know, custom JavaScript or whatever, and then you just spit it out to all of them. Um, and like I said, it's web-based technology, so it's going to be a smaller learning curve, especially for the people in this room. Um, the cons, it's going to be less performant than native on less capable devices. So if you use this on one of the even mid, early to mid-level Android devices, it's pretty much just going to fall apart. And there's, there's ways that you can use Cordova without Ionic, and you can get away with it. So Ionic takes advantage of a lot of really advanced CSS, trans, 3D translates and a lot kind of stuff to do a lot of the effects. So if you were to say, look, I'm going to use Cordova and just use simple HTML, the older browsers are going to be able to handle it better. And you might even be able to do some fallbacks. But if you're using the full capabilities of Ionic and you use it on even like a mid to old level Android, you're going to have a lot of trouble there. Um, you're limited to the UI capabilities of the modern web, which means you're going to be at a spot where you want to do something and there's no built-in directive, CSS directive from Ionic, 
and you don't know how to do it in CSS, and maybe it's not possible in CSS, and if that's it, then that's it. Thankfully, Modern Web can do a lot of pretty incredible stuff. If you see people building a Star Trek enterprise out of CSS, you can understand we have a lot of capabilities open to us. But still, you don't get, someone will say, oh, well, there's this really easy way to do things in, you know, in iOS. I see this, this particular interface you know, everywhere in iOS. Well, it doesn't matter because this is a web view. It doesn't get access to all the list styles of iOS. You're doing this all from scratch on web and then wrapping it up and then delivering it to iOS. Um, and then finally, Ionic is opinionated. So Ionic is opinionated, which is beneficial for spinning things up faster. It means that it's going to hold your hand in a lot of ways. So like a bootstrap or like a Rails, it's going to make your initial development a lot faster. But like a bootstrap or a Rails, once you want to do things that Ionic doesn't have built in, you might find it tugging against you because it's like, no, we have our way of doing things and you need to stay within that way. How far that's going to affect you depends on what specific things you want to do. But sometimes you're going to run a situation where something seems really easy, but it's like easy off of a cliff of what Ionic does, and you might find it being a lot more work than you're going to think. And something else might seem super complex, and Ionic already has a directive built for it, and you can do it like that. So it takes a little understanding to figure out what are its capabilities and where is it going to shine and where is it not going to shine. So things you need to know and get set up, you need to have Node and NPM up and running because everything's going to be based on various things. I mean, Ionic, uh, some of the pieces of Cordova, and then also Gulp, which is going to make your life a lot better, all you use Node. Um, if you're using SAS, then you need to have a local version of Ruby up and running, managed by um, uh, Ruby version manual, ma manager, preferably, and then SAS. You need to know Angular and SAS enough to at least operate in them, um, and then your life will be a lot better with Gulp. And if you want to do any actual deploys other than just developing it locally, you're going to need Xcode and a $99 a year uh, Android developer or uh, Apple developer subscription, um, and or the Android Eclipse local SDK package, and I think $20 a year Android development thing. So getting set up with your first Ionic project, um, the first thing you got to do is you got to install Ionic globally. So it's a Node package. Um, is there anybody here who's not familiar with um, RVM? or NPM. I can give you a really quick intro to what they are. Please feel free to say so it'll all make sense. Just okay, Node. just real quick install. So Node is JavaScript run, instead of in the browser, it's run locally, it's a server, and Node um, is based on packages. When you do Node or when you do a lot of modern development with Ruby or other things like that, you're rather than writing all the code from scratch, you're going to say, well, there's a package that interacts with this thing. There's a package that processes dates. There's a package that handles time zones. There's a package that does this. And so your app for starters, whatever it is, whether it's command line, server, or whatever, is going to pull in a whole bunch of packages and operate based on those. And so NPM is very good at allowing us to run things from the, from the command line that is purely for the purpose of running that package. So for example, right here we see that Cordova is a package based on Node. It's a Node package. And so in order to do all those things, you use Node Package Manager. It's an app you, or it's a command line utility that you run and allows you to install either in your particular project or globally using this dash G, a node package. And so what we're saying right here is, there's two node packages I want to be accessible from my command line anywhere on my system, Cordova and Ionic. So I already have NPM up and running. If you don't have it up and running, there's pl plenty of tutorials. So what I'm telling it is, I'll install Cordova, install Ionic, and instead of installing them in this directory for the specific project, install them globally so I can use them anywhere. So now we've got Cordova running. I can say which Cordova in the command line or run Cordova and I'll actually be able to run. Same thing with Ionic. Then I need to be able to create a project. So one of the things that Ionic makes it really easy for you to do is clone one of their default projects, dump it into a directory that you chose the name of, and instantly start modifying that. Uh, especially because it's so opinionated, it's going to be a lot easier for you to work that way versus having to write everything from scratch every time. So you use this Ionic command, which is just an, a node package that is installed globally, and then it has a parameter. It has a command named start, and then you pass in a few things. And so the first thing we're going to pass in is the name of the project. It's actually going to create a directory called front end awesome as a subdirectory of whatever I'm working. And then there's a template, and that's the second piece. And the various templates that are available to you are uh, side menu, tabs, and blank. And so as you can see down here, blank is just an app. There's no, no framework around it. Um, tabs is header at the top, three tabs down at the bottom, so like an Instagram kind of thing. And then side menu allows you to slide over whatever you're doing to the left or the right, and then you've got a list there in the left or the right. And then we can CD into that directory. And once we CD into that directory, and we'll hopefully have enough time to do all this later, um, you'll actually see the, the framework sitting there ready for you to do some work with it. Um, oh, I introduced NPM, but not RVM. So um, RVM is not the same as NPM. Ruby, 
is something, it's a, it's a backend language, it's similar to, you know, like a PHP or something like that. But unlike a PHP, it's a scripting language and it's very powerful to use on the command line. So similarly to what we were talking about with node packages, sometimes you might want to use a Ruby package, which is called a Ruby gem, to run things from the command line, or you might want to include one in one of your projects. So um, you're going to use Ruby gems to do the same. So Ruby gems and, and, and node package manager are kind of similar. Um, and when I mentioned Ruby version manager, it's because Installing Ruby, um, different projects may have 10 different versions of Ruby for def 10 different projects. So Ruby version manager makes it easier for you to have 10 different versions of Ruby running in your system and to swap back and forth between them easily. With Node, that's sometimes a thing, but not as much. So your main things you're going to want here, you want Node up and running, which is going to come with NPM. You want Ruby up and running. It's going to be easier to manage with um, RVM, and Ruby is going to come with Ruby gems. Sounds kind of confusing, but you can go back to this talk later and just basically get an introduction to each of those uh, apps and get them installed really easy with tutorials available online. So before we do any customization, we just want to make sure that we're actually capable of spitting this out into an app. So first thing we do is we say Ionic build iOS. And it's probably going to give you a prompt that says something like, oh, you don't have this particular Cordova emulator installed. And Ionic builds on Cordova, so the first time you run Ionic build iOS, it'll probably say, you should run this command, and then it'll install the Cordova iOS emulator. So you copy it, you paste it, you run it, it's easy. Same thing for if you do Ionic build Android or anything else. And then you say Ionic emulate iOS. Um, so what Ionic build em uh, iOS does is it takes all your things, it runs it together, and spits out like an Xcode ready project that is actually an app that is all your HTML, all your CSS, all your JavaScript bundled together, ready to be delivered to Xcode, which is the development environment for iOS apps. It's not ready to be delivered to a phone yet. It hasn't generated an IPA, it hasn't sent it out to test flight, but it's ready to be worked on. And once it's there, then you can point all your development tools at it. You can point Xcode at it, and you can open it up, and you can make changes to it, and you can send it from Xcode over to test flight or whatever else. Or you can run the iOS emulator that's built into your machine, which is what this automatically does for you. So if you run Ionic Emulate iOS, and we'll, try, we'll do all this all, all later, it's going to spin up a little iOS emulator, and it's going to actually show your, your app directly in front of you. And then finally, Ionic Serve. Um, when you're developing, you're not going to want to run Ionic Emulate iOS every single time you make a change. It takes a while. If you run Ionic Serve, it's going to spin up a version of your thing in your browser that looks just like what you're working on, but, but every time you make a change, it's going to use Live Reload. It's going to push your changes in your browser, and you're going to see the changes update the moment you make a change in the code. Again, I'll show that to you in a minute. So Ionic Build iOS, Ionic Emulate iOS is getting ready for actually looking, like, looking at what it looks like in the, uh, the emulator and actually sending it out to a phone. Ionic Serve is where you're going to live in a day-to-day -day basis of actually doing your work. So once you've got that up and running, you're actually going to customize your styles. Everything's in SAS. There's a major SAS file at the top. And there's basically three chunks of your file that you're going to create. So up top, there's a whole bunch of variables. And the, the variables all have defaults. So you never have to set one of these variables, and you'll get a blank, you know, plain gray and black, looks fine um, app. But when you start digging into the Ionic source code in the documentation, you'll find that you can customize these variables, and they'll change a lot of the aspects, usually colors, but sometimes fonts or padding sizes. Um, so all the SAS for Ionic, rather than having hard-coded colors, uh, paddings and all that, they're all based on variables that have defaults. But if I come in here and I set stable to be E8, F8, F8, which is a little bit re less red, and a little bit more green and a little bit more blue, we're all of a sudden going to be getting this kind of like orangish yellowish color for stable rather than the default stable, which is a flat gray. And so now everywhere in the whole site that stable is, or in the whole app that stable is used, that I'm going to get that tint. And so you're going to start seeing that tint pop everywhere. And so you start learning what are these variables available to me. And there's stable and there's active and there's all these different things. You can customize the whole app without touching any CSS other than just changing these variables. And after the import, which is going to run all of your, um, is going to import all your variables, then you can also add your own custom CSS styles. You can make up new classes, you can do whatever, you can override Ionic classes, you can do whatever you want. And then finally, you actually do your own content. Um, I can't give you a full in introduction to Angular and how templating works. I'll show you a little bit, but just to give you a heads up, especially for those of you who've worked with Angular or Ember, Ember before, you've got your normal directives, and just so you guys know, a directive is sort of like if you were to imagine um, an HTML element, like, uh, like a field set or an input. <clears throat> but you make up your own, and then you use JavaScript to define what the behavior of that own element is. So I could create a new element called my awesome list, 
And then I could say, well, my awesome list is going to have this, this, this in it, and it's going to be applied to this bit of JavaScript. And every time I run it, it's going to have this style running. And every time I change anything, it's going to do this. I'm defining that all in a JavaScript file that defines this directive. And then I go to my HTML and I just write my awesome list. And then it's automatically applied in there. It's going to generate the HTML for me. So it's like custom HTML elements with a lot of fancy JavaScript applied to it. Um, markup um, is literally if you want some of your data to show up in the code, you just type the variable name in between the double squiggly braces. So if you ever work with handlebars or anything like that, that's going to be really familiar. So if you've got a variable name name, you put the name between the double squigglies and then it's going to output the name there. Um, you have access to all the normal Angular directives. Uh, we'll see some of those, ng repeat, ng model, ng controller. Um, but then Ionic also adds some directives that makes it very easy to do some of the things we were looking at earlier, where the panels are swi swiping back and forth, you got the tabs at the bottom, and a lot of other things I'll show you. Um, and then finally, filters, which you're used to um, if you've done Angular before, which is you take a large amount of data, you pass it through some kind of filter, and it filters it for you in the view, so you don't have to do all that work in the controller. If you've never used Angular, I know this might seem a little overwhelming, we'll look at examples in a minute. So. The core of your Ionic app, this is using a page router that you're probably familiar with if you've done Angular before, but if you haven't, that's okay. Anywhere there's three dots, there's gonna be a whole bunch of crap that you don't need to worry about right now because once you start looking at this, it's actually gonna make a lot of sense. So Angular module, I'm gonna tell you what the module's name, I'm gonna tell you all this configuration stuff, but in the end we get to this bottom, and I'm basically defining a whole bunch of states, and states is just like a page. So if you're used to building a website, let's say you've got posts.html, and then my first post.html, my second post.html, whatever. Each of those is going to have their own state. Unless it's, you know, there's 15 posts, there's going to be a single state for that that can have different data passed to it. Um, you're going to be a lot more familiar with this if you ever work with Ruby or PHP, Laravel, Coding Editor, because this is just like your routes file. Um, and so you basically define the name of the state, app.posts. You define the URL that you can get that state at, slash posts. And then you're passing in various information in the views. And so one of the conventions of Ionic is everything goes into menu content. And you've got a template URL that is going to say, where is the HTML template for displaying this state? And then the controller, which is where are we going to get the data to put into that? And you're just going to see this over and over and over again. If I want to add a post, I'm going to add a new state for post. If I want to add a search, I'm going to add app.search. And I'm going to pass it to the template slash search dot HTML directory and I'm, or template, and I'm going to have a search controller. So piece by piece by piece, we're associating URLs with templates and then using controllers to fill them with data. If you've ever worked with M MVCs, this will be very familiar. And then in controllers, you actually are defining each of your controllers. Again, there's a whole bunch of boilerplate at the top, but when you get down to it, you're saying controller, post controller. What does it do? Well, right here I'm saying in the scope, and the scope is kind of the way of defining what's all the data that should be accessible to my view. I'm saying here's an array of posts. It's a list of posts. Each post has an ID, a title, and a body. I'm going to pass it five posts. And who cares where those posts came from? They might have come from an API somewhere. They might have come from a local storage cache. I might have made them all up and thrown them in the controller. It might be a local file. In the end, my controller says, hey, scope. Here are the th pieces of data I want to be available to you. And then once we wrote, load a view, which was already defined in app.js, it says, oh, hey, look, I've got posts available to me. Hey, look, it's an array. Each of them is an is a object, and this object has an ID, a body, and a title. I can iterate over that array, and I can spit out a list. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And then finally, posts.html. So ion view, remember I said directives in Angular are just kind of making up an HTML element. Ion view is a made up HTML element for Ionic. It's a directive that says, here's a view. So this is associated with basically one of those states we were looking at. So this one is the state which was app.posts, but I want the title at the top to say feed, so I say feed. And then inside that, you've got a new directive called ion content. Um, the ion content and ion view are almost always the same. It's just the wrapper. Um, but Ion Content allows you to flick up and down and use these very nice, very native feeling scrollers that you won't get natively by using your thumb over some just normal HTML page. And it's using this really complicated translate 3D stuff that thankfully you never need to worry about unless you're trying to run your Ionic app on a really slow Android device and then it's trying to run all these translate 3Ds and it craps out. So you could theoretically just not use Ion Content and do a lot of work manually. I don't recommend it. But for example, if you're like, oh, well, I want a fixed search header up at the top, and even when you flick around, I want it to the fixed set header to stay, stay there, well, you put it outside of the Ion Content, so their fancy Translate 3D stuff doesn't go around. But normally, you just think of Ion Content as the contents of the pane that you're in. And then I'm in here, and I'm using some default styles, just kind of bootstrap style styles. There's a list, a list has an item, and I say ng repeat, which is a normal um, Angular directive that says do one of these for each, and then I say for each post in posts. 
Remember we had the posts array. So I said for each of these, do this. And then it just says, make a link to the page for that. You can see I'm linking to app slash post slash in the post ID and then echo the post title. So this is a template basically saying create a list and for every single one of the entries in the posts array, make a link and that link, well, make an item, div class item, within that have a link, the link should have a href to the, to the post, and then it has, should have the title of that post. Yeah, I thought uh, Angular is uh, mostly for the front end, uh, <coughs> but I see from here is you're using it as a, as a back end, something like Express? Yeah, so Angular and Ember and all the other frameworks like that are used on the front end and they act like a back end. So when you work in them, they're gonna feel like an MVC, they're gonna feel like Express, Rails, CodeIgniter, Laravel, whatever. They're going to have controllers. Sometimes they treat them a little different, but you know some of them are model, view, view, controller, whatever. But in the end, you're going to have all these definitions. And so usually these are for creating single page apps. So what, what you're kind of referencing is, well, I would have multiple pages in my backend app, and then front end usually just makes each of those pages look different. These are instead saying, my backend feeds data, and then my JavaScript, my front end, there's only a single page, and it's making the, the appearance of pages. It's changing the URL manually. So it is owning, your, your single JavaScript file that you loaded is owning the navigation between pages and that kind of idea. Does that make sense? Um, and then we've got post.html. So we, remember, we looked, we clicked on app slash post slash one, and so it's taking us to the controller, it would be, after this, it would be one named post controller. It would take the ID and it would give us the post just with that ID. And then we pass this in here. And you can notice it looks almost the same, but it doesn't need to iterate over many posts because we're on a page for a single post. And so now it's just saying, oh, I've got post, post.title, post. Uh, oh, I didn't change that. It should say post.body. And so this is the display page where we decide this is how I'm going to output the content for this particular post. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind going back a few slides where you had the states defined for posts, uh, I see that you have the URL post there, and on the next slide you have an ID specified in the anchor tag. Mm -hmm. Do you need to put, or do you need to declare that there's going to be a, an attribute or yep. something fast? I'll that? show you in a bit, but we would have a new state that would be app.post, and its URL would be slash posts. And then there'd be the identifier saying, here's, there's going to be a variable here named post that then it's, ends up getting passed in your controller. Please. All right. So a few other pieces, and then I hope we have enough time for us to actually build an app. Um, we've got, uh, so like I said, Ionic is like Bootstrap in a lot of ways. It's going to come with CSS components. It's going to come with JavaScript components. So it's got these Cordova wrappers that make your life easier. It's got these opinionated ways to set up your routing and stuff like that. But it's also got a lot of things to make just building a website easier. Because in the end, you're still going to be building a website. So it's got a whole bunch of CSS components that are sort of bootstrappy, but they're specifically targeted at building apps. So you've got things like toggle buttons, and there's all sorts of attributes that you can set on them. You've got specifically radio buttons that work really well in this context. You've got tabs, you've got grids, you've got all these things, and you just look through each of them, and they've got a really nice view of what it looks like. They show you how to use it. Um, they've also got Ionicons, which is their own set of icons that are specifically targeted for mobile development, and they're, they've got a uh, generic set, an iOS set, and an Android set, so it's really easy. And you've got default media queries baked in, telling you which specific um, environment you're in. <clears throat> So in a lot of contexts, you might end up saying, make this one be the Android back button in this context and the iOS back button in this context. You have the flexibility to do that. It's not perfect, but it gets you a lot of the way, especially for just bootstrapping things. And then you've got JavaScript components. Um, so uh, they're relatively complex in how the back end is structured. If you're an Angular person, you'll be able to figure it out with the delegates and all that stuff. But in the end, it's basically going to do just what the CSS did. It's going to say, here's the name of a thing, tabs, slide menu. There's a slide box here where you swipe through different images or whatever. Um, it's going to say, here's the code you should put to do it. Here's how to pass the data, all that kind of stuff. These are a little more complex if you want to do anything other than just kind of like put data in there. Ah. Um, but if you just want to put data in here, instantly you get a lot of very complex UI up and running uh, very easily for you. And then finally, you're going to want to distribute your content. I talked about this a little bit. Um, so for iOS, you're going to do Ionic Build iOS, and it's going to spit all your stuff into your, your, your thing slash platform slash iOS, and you're going to see an actual Xcode project there. You can open it up in Xcode. You can do whatever you want with it. So what we would normally do is we'd open it up. We'd make sure all settings are right. We would create the IPA. We would send it to test flight. 
and then we use TestFlight to distribute it to all of our testers. And just so you guys know, TestFlight is a free app. It just got bought by Apple, so it's going to be integrated better soon. But it allows you to have a list of people whose phones are authenticated for your particular profile, your provisioning profile. And once they basically tell TestFlight, yeah, I'm on board, you have access to it, and then you tell them you have a, they have access to your particular project. Every time you do a new build, you just say send it to all my people in this project and they get an email. They said open this email on your phone, press the button and it downloads the latest version of your app. So you get all your testing team using it, you get your client using it and you do that before you're ready to send it over to the App Store. Android, um, emulating an Android is a horrible pain in the butt and I would avoid it if you have any control over it. It's a terrible mess, it's everything that's wrong with user interfaces, but getting it onto your Android device is the easiest thing on the planet. So emulating an Android is downloading these Eclipse SDKs and downloading all these horrible templates and even then the simulator that you get looks like it was made in the 90s by some kid with Photoshop, it's terrible. But if you want to put it on your Android device, you plug it in with the USB and you say Ionic run Android, puts it in your device and it's there. You don't have to pay any money, you don't have to deal with test flight, it's just there and it's up and running. So varying levels difficulty, overall the iOS experience is a little more work but it's a better architected experience once you understand it. Android, the experience is totally messy but getting it on your phone is easy as pie. Um, a few miscellaneous pieces. Um, if you're going to do this, Chrome DevTools Emulate is your best friend on the planet. So like I said, when you use Ionic Serve, it's going to spin up this website in your browser. It's going to be a website that's optimized for this tiny little screen, especially a lot of the CSS you're going to write up front. You're probably just going to target um, iPhone. Don't do that, but you will anyway. And so it's going to open it up in your big old browser, and everything's going to be stretched and squashed, and it's going to look terrible. So a little trick in Chrome DevTools, when you've got your DevTools open, you switch from console over to emulation, and you can choose a specific device to emulate. You can say, I want to emulate the iPhone 5, and it'll switch your cursor over to a fake thumb cursor. It'll switch the size of your screen. It'll send a different user agent. Everything Chrome is capable of doing to emulate this, and this is not Ionic specific, it will do. And so all of a sudden you've got like a little fake, and you've got to refresh after you apply it, or it'll look really confusing. So you've got this beautiful kind of like fake iPhone up and running. You're like 97% of the way at that point. You still need to test everything on the iOS emulator before you really consider it good, because there's some quirks there, but this is going to get you the majority of the way. And because you have Chrome, you can install the Live Reload extension, which means every single time Ionic Serve detects a change in any of your files, it's going to bump your browser, and it's going to bump the CSS changes, the JavaScript over changes over your browser without even refreshing your browser. It'll re rewrite your old CSS, insert some new CSS, and you'll see the colors change in front of you without actually hitting refresh. And then there's a thing called Foreman, and I've got a blog post on my site that you guys can look up at mattstoffer.co if you've never used Foreman before. But Foreman allows you to define a proc file, and what you do is you say name of process, and you can type whatever you want, awesome process, colon space, and then a, and a command line code that it should run, um, and you do as many of those as you want, and then you save it. And then when you run Foreman start in that directory, it's going to run all of those concurrently. So one of the things you, you'll notice here is that, well, I want to run gulp watch in one of my things to make sure that gulp is concatenating my, you know, running SAS and running my JavaScript and all stuff. But then somewhere else I need to be able to run Ionic Serve to spin it up. And maybe you'll find there's some other thing you need to run. You make a proc file and then every single time you start your work in one browser or one terminal tab, you hit form and start and they're all running there. They're all spitting out their output and you're ready to go. Again, I'll show you what this looks like. So let's go. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are literally, um, I, for your benefit, I'm going to go back through here one by one through my steps and I'm just going to follow the instructions here. Now some of them I don't need to do, I've already installed npm install Cordova Ionic, so let's go here. Ionic start front end awesome side menu. Well I've actually got one named that, so I'm going to do Ionic start front end awesome demo and then side menu. Matt, can you bump up the text How's that? And so it's going to download basically the template from Ionic. The Ionic's already installed, but it's downloading the template for this particular file. So it's basically going up to GitHub, it's pulling down a zip, it's unzipping it, and it's making sure all my plugins are installed. So then we CD in, front end awesome. I feel like half the problems with live demos is typing is so hard when everybody's watching you. So we list it out, and we've got an entire directory here. And if you're not familiar with opening things in that space, oh, that's harder to read. We'll do this. So you've got a Bower file. Bower is another th node package. You don't need to worry about it right now. You've got a README telling you what to do. Um, you've got config.xml, which is how you edit the things that are going to be like so, for example. Um, right here, this is how I define the name of my app in the when it's actually like the little 
the strip strip of text that goes underneath my app icon on my home screen. So um, in the description, you can edit all this kind of stuff. We're not going to worry about that right now. Um, gulp file. Um, we've talked about build scripts a little bit before. So gulp is a build script like grunt or like um, not rake, but whatever the one is for Ruby. Um, and it's going to tell you, it's going to say, watch all my SAS files the moment I change them, run them through SAS, minify them, you know, rename them to .min.sss, CSS, and then send over to this other directory. And then it's going to watch your JavaScript. It's going to watch your Git. You know, it's going to do all those things, and it's just basically going to watch out for you. Um, and so we just are going to run gulp watch, and it's going to run all that for us. Um, and actually, we can just do that right now. Gulp, oh. When you uh, uh, first start any project that's based on NPM, it's going to have a package.json, and all of the node packages it needs will not come with it. So you just run NPM up, install up front, and it's going to pull in all those packages for you. That way, the, package, the, the, the packages you're installing can be much lighter because they, they don't include their dependencies. They let you install them manually. OK, cool. So now they're installed. So now we can run gulp watch. And now it's going to sit, and it's going to wait for me to make changes to some of my files. And just to give you a little bit of an example, That's hard to read. I'll go into my SAS file and I'll vim ionic.app.css and let's go down and do that thing we did before. And I'll sorry, I'll make this easier to read in a minute. Here, it's giving me a couple directives. Well, I want to change calm to be red just because I'm a crazy guy like that. Okay, so I'm gonna hit enter. I'm gonna save it, and then on the left side. It saw that I made that change. It ran the SAS ta task. It re-output my CSS. OK, so let's go back here. So now we've got ionic.project, which are some specific settings for ionic. Not much going on here. Um, and then we've got our actual files, which are going to live in SCSS and www. Um, for y'all's sake, we're going to open this up in Sublime Text. Oh, that's so hard to read, though. Um, so I'm going to go in, actually, let's serve it real quick. So we'll do ionic build iOS, which is, and you don't have to do this to serve it, but I'm just going to do it to make sure it's okay. And it says, look, no platforms added. Please use Cordova platform add. Okay, great. So I'll do that. I wait for Cordova to install this platform for this particular project. And now I'll try it again. So it's building it. It's actually creating an Xcode app. So when we go to platforms iOS, this is actually all the things you'd see in Xcode, ready to go. So let's do Ionic Emulate iOS. So it's doing all that same thing again, even though it doesn't really need to. You don't need to run build before you run emulate, because it's the same thing. But then it's opening up the iOS emulator, and it's going to spit it up in my face once it's ready. And we can actually run our app. And that, the app comes by default with some fake little playlist thing. This is up and running. This is you know a retina iPhone, or we can switch to a different size Retina iPhone, or we can go to an iPad or whatever. And you're actually clicking around your little device here, and you actually find your f.awesome, and you can open it up and you can run it. So we have an app literally up and running, ready to go. There's nothing interesting in it, but this is actually an app. Um, let's see, do our directions tell us to do anything else, or can we start building? Build and emulate customized styles. OK, so let's customize the style real quick. Like I said, I'll do this all in Sublime Text. Um, actually, I'm not going to because life, well, no, that, okay. So, sorry. So I'm going to add a proc file and I'm going to say my two lines, gulp, oops, gulp is going to be gulp watch. Remember this left side is the name, the right side is what's running. And then serve is going to be ionic serve. Save it and now I say form and start. And so what we see back here is you've got color-coded things. And so these are all the messages that are coming from gulp, because they say gulp next to them, and it's got the color for gulp. And these are all the messages running from serve. And they're going to run hand in hand, and you'll get all the notifications here. But I don't need to worry about them right now, because it's running. And it opened up my browser, and it spun it up to an app. And you see it looks just like that fake app we're doing. So then I open up my Chrome developer tools, and I say emulate an iPhone 5. And then I refresh, because the styles are off. And there we go. And you can see that my cursor is this little thumb looking thing. So I actually, I can't scroll up and down with my touchpad because that's gone. It's actually emulating it. So I've got to drag things to use them. So we've got that up and running. Let's change a style. Uh, I think I closed it. So we go to our SCSS. 
And instead of calm, let's use stable, because I think that's what the default is. And let's set it to red and just see how much, how much fun that is for us. So I want to have this up and running so that you guys can watch it happen. Oops. I'm assuming there's stable here. I think there is. Ah, there's no stable. Okay. Um, if I didn't mention it, in order to get the live reload thing working, you need the live reload uh, browser plugin installed. So let's figure out. This is bar stable. Oh no. Like I said, everything breaks when you do a live demo. This should be working, but that's okay. It would work normally. So let's move on to changing our content. So we're gonna go to www slash templates and we're gonna pick, first let's just make sure we can actually do something. So we're gonna go back to the root of the app. I don't wanna log in. And we've got our playlists, reggae, chill, dubstep, indie, rap, cowbell. Um, so this is playlists.html and we take a look at it. Um, sorry guys, I haven't used Sublime Text in a long time. Um, so it's the same thing we were seeing before where you got ng repeat equals playlist in playlists. So this means it's getting the playlists um, information from somewhere else. We're going to guess it's going to be a controller. So we're going to go into JS and then we're going to go to controllers.js and we see here, look, scope.playlists for playlist control. So we're starting to see where these pieces of content come together. So let's say I really don't like Cowbell, but I love Motown. So I hit refresh auto there. I didn't even refresh my browser. I just hit save on it and that was it. Motown's good. What if I want Motown to move up a little bit? Um, I use a PHP storm shortcut in sublime text and it doesn't work. Do this. This is good. There we go. Motown's moved up a little bit. So we are now changing our data. We can change our playlists and say, you know, this, and all of a sudden it's going to be in there for us. So this is just a normal website. We're making changes to the normal website. It spits it out to Ionic Serve at any point we want. We emulate it out to a real app. We use the SAS to change our um, colors, and we're up and developing an app. So let's say we want to build an app that's a little more complex. Let's say we want to, for example, build an app that shows us a list of all of the events coming up for this front-end meetup. So we do the meetup API and we find that using my key we can go to events and there's a git for all events as long as i know group id well i happen to know our group id um, and so let's go in here there's this nice little console let's me try it and it says group id and now i've got to find where i put it It's not going to be there. You'd think I'd have these things ready. Oh no. Okay, well, we are going to. Man. So, in order to make sure I knew what I was doing before I did this, I made a fake version of this app beforehand, and it has a group ID available to it. So we're going to go steal it from there. Uh, oh, it's not in there. It's in our Meetup API service. That's why. Um, so one of the things I ran into here is that um, have you guys ever dealt with cores before? C O R S. Okay. So enough people didn't nod their heads and I'll share it with you, the basics. So when you have two backend servers talking to each other um, using APIs or whatever, they're gonna connect to each other very nicely. It's gonna be fine. The moment you have a front end browser trying to hit some of those, often you're gonna run into this thing called cores, which is cross origin request sharing, I think. And it basically is a set of rules and what it really is is a set of not really well implemented or maybe never implemented rules that theoretically should teach these systems how to talk to each other, front end to back end, and instead end up making it really difficult for your front end code to reach back end APIs. And they're like, hey, sorry, we don't have a rule set, a cores rule set that says your browser and localhost dot whatever can access our data on api.meetup.com. Sorry, too bad. Now there's all these ways you can deal with it. You can deal with OAuth authentication so that nobody can ever hit code on your website unless they go over, OAuth authenticate on meetup.com, come back to your app, and then it's only going to last for an hour. It's a big hassle. I hope you never have to deal with it. 
What I do instead when I'm doing dummies like this is I'm like, well, my backend code doesn't have to deal with cores. So I'm going to spend 30 minutes. I'm going to write a Laravel app, and it's going to pull all that data, cache it locally, and then it's going to spit it up to my app without my app needing to have cores set up. So that's what I did. In 30 minutes, I wrote a Laravel app, and it just basically goes and it pulls a couple of meetup APIs, and all the events by our, um, by our meetup, and then any individual event by the event ID. Can you repeat how you It's not a fix. It's a workaround. It's a total hack. So what I did was um, I built, I'll show you. Um, that's really hard to read. Let's see if this is any better. OK. So I built a thing um, in Laravel, but you could write it in Express or Rails or whatever. Um, and all it does is it provides routes. This is hard to read, too. Um, so there's a route called meetup slash events. And it hits the API, the meetup's API. And because it's a backend, it doesn't have to deal with all those cores issues. It caches the API's result, stores it locally, every, and it only refreshes from meetups every 60 minutes. And then it spits the exact same result back out to me, which means no cores issues because I didn't put cores here. And way, way, way faster because my server is endlessly faster than meetups server. So I'll actually do this sometimes when it's going to be faster for de development or I don't have to deal with it. This is not a long-term solution because if somebody discovers my inter intermediary server, then they can abuse the crap out of my API key. But for now, it got us around this demo having to deal with this, even though now I've talked about it for 15 minutes. So this is why when you see us going to these things, rather than a full api.meetup.com um, API, I built this in, Rails, or in, in Laravel, and I actually timed it. It's 25 minutes, because I think Laravel is fantastic for making, allowing me to make things spin up really quickly. So 25 minutes, and then I put it up on Laravel Forge on DigitalOcean. And so it is meetup.superfriends.co slash api slash meetup. And then I've got events, which lists all the events. So these are these. I didn't do anything fancy here. This is just spitting out what the meetups.com API would spit out, um, which is all the events for ours. And then, uh, so this is the one we're at right now. And then I go to an event ID. And if I grab that ID, meetup slash events slash that ID, oops, it's going to give me all the details about the particular event that we're looking for. So that was just a quick rudimentary thing to make building out this front end app a little bit faster for us. So back to what we were actually doing. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to go into our controller, um, and we're going to make a new controller, and we're going to name it events controller. And we're going to say pass in the scope, because we always want to work in the scope. And what I, what I want to do theoretically is I want to pass in just something like we were doing there, scope.events equals an array. And that array should have a list of events. And you know, I'll probably need like, well, I'll just fake this out and we'll get real data in a minute. We'll probably need an ID. We'll need a name, you know, and maybe a description. So then I need a URL for this. So I go to app.js. And I say, well, I actually really don't need any of these things we're dealing with this here. Now, this right here is the core. As you can see, it's an abstract. Leave that there. But all these other ones, I don't need search, I don't need browse. Why don't I take playlists in single and turn them into events and event? So I'm going to change the name. I'm going to change the URL. And all of a sudden, we see this thing that Richard was asking for. How do we put a variable in the URL? Right here. It looks a little Ruby-ish. So I'm going to do colon event ID. And then what are my views going to be? Templates slash events.html. And then events control. And then template slash event html and event control and then at the way bottom you get to determine what should everything back up to if the the url that they try to go to doesn't work or if they're just there at the beginning app slash events so now we've got a nice easy template set up and running we've got two routes two states we've got events and event and we got two controllers so let's go to our controllers. And again, we can get rid of all this stuff because this is all login related. We don't need to deal with any of this kind of stuff. Um, app controls, um, just like the app state is your top level state everything descends from, app controls your top controller. So anything that happens in app control will be available everywhere. So stuff that has to do with left rails or consistent elements, um, they all want to live there. So we've got events control, and let's do event control. OK, so theoretically, all we got to do is go to our templates. Again, let's just delete all these. And so now we can just rename these. This is events. Man. .html. 
and this is event.html. Okay, we go to our events, and almost everything's going to be the same. We just rename a little bit of stuff. And the nice thing about this template is it provides us the space to recognize that most apps are going to have a list of something somewhere, a single one somewhere. Let's take those and let's start working with those rather than having to do it all from scratch. Come and you're like, oh, well, it's not playlist and playlists. You know, it's going to be event in events. And then here's the same kind of thing. Uh, our link is to app events event.id. Our text is to event.title. Great. And then we go to our event. And again, event. Cool. So I'm sure that I missed something. Something's going to break. But theoretically, we just did the work that it took. We went to app.js and we set up our routes. We've got states for every single one of those URLs. They point to a template. They point to a controller. We created one template, one controller for our two views, the events view, the event view. And then we put fake data. Oh, you know what we didn't do? We didn't put fake data in events control. So let's do this. Scope.events. But it's not going to be two events. It's going to be a single event. So instead of an array of events, it's just going to be a single event. Theoretically, it'll just work. Let's go back here. Let's refresh it, and it doesn't work. That's OK. Oh, it's because Foreman quit out. Let's go down a little bit and see where we get. Um, so sometimes things are going to quit out. It's not always going to be the easiest thing ever because you're going to stack trace. And if you're not used to back-end development, this look, might look a little confusing. Um, this one right here, I don't think we even need to worry about. So let's just try it out again and see what happens. OK, events, great. Uh, it's not displaying everything correctly, but it's an events page, name events. And we've got a single entry here, which we can kind of see a little bit. Um, and then if I tap it, it takes me to the event page. Great, so we're almost there. So the only thing we're missing is why is there no text in there? So let's go to our events uh, template and figure out why is it, it's not event.title, it's event.name. Go back, I'm not gonna hit the refresh button, I'm just gonna tab over, it's already there. That's live road auto injecting it for me. Great, awesome event, hit tab, now I'm in the event. So again, we literally now have an app with a list, you tap into a list, you see the data for the list, you're using HTML, you can use their pre-made CSS or not, and you actually create these specific views in your app. And there's these nice little slidey things that slides over, things appear, that's where Ionic is doing the CSS fanciness for you to make it feel a little bit more like a native app. Um, you could use Cordova without Ionic and not worry about any of that stuff. Or you could use you know, some pieces but not other pieces. But this whole package is Ionic. So that's not real data, Matt. You have an API, Matt. Why don't you use the real API data? Well, um, what we need to do is inject in little helpers that help us do other things. And so we talked about dependency injection when whoever it was that talked about Angular. Um, if you don't understand dependency injection, don't worry about it. Just recognize that what you're basically going to do is when you're in this scope, whether it's a controller or whatever, you're going to tell it, hey, I need this other little library, this little package, this little feature, this helper available to me. So you just kind of tell it up here, I need HTTP. And what I know is there's one named HTTP that's going to let me do things with HTTP. So I tell it up there, make it available to me. So if I were to do this, it's going to error out. Well, if I were to do this, because it's not available to me. But once I do this, all of a sudden it knows to inject it for me. It's called dependency injection. So I don't have the HTTP get syntax memorized at the moment, so we're actually going to go copy it from somewhere else. Oh, I actually made a service. Dang it. I was hoping we were going to do it piece by piece. Um, well, OK, I can show you what the service looks like. Thanks. <laughs> we'll still do it like this. So here you go. HTTP.get URL, and then you pass in some parameters, and then dot then, and then it's whatever it does as a result. So if you ever work with jQuery promises or anything like that, you're already going to be familiar with this, or ES6 six promises. So basically, you grab this, and then you say, first of all, scope events is nothing, because we're going to be pulling it from some external service. And then I say, HTTP.get, and so what I'm saying is go to some external service, and so we'll clean this up in a little bit, but it's basically meetup.superfriends.co slash API slash meetup slash events. Sure, use a cache, and then when it's done, take this data and then do something with it. Um, and so, you know, right now, let's just do a console.log. Anybody see any syntax errors? Look good. OK, cool. So theoretically, we open up this page, we check our console, and we should see all that data that we just pulled down. There you go. There's an object, and that object has configuration information, headers, but it also has a data. 
in the data as a result of a single event. And look, there's the event that we're at right now. So we're pulling this from my external thing, and now we can do what we want with it. There's various ways you can pass it in your view. You can say things like um, scope.events equals response.data.results, I think is what we would want. Let's try that out and just see if it miraculously works. Um, whoa, July front end developers meetup. There we go. That's there, that's populated. I wish we had 10 more events so you could see that, but it's up and running, it's pulling from an external API. Cool, and then you do a kind of similar thing down here. Scope.event is nothing. Um, does anybody here not understand what asynchronous code is? That's totally fine if you don't, I just wanna make sure you get it. Cool. Um, synchronous code is what we're used to. You see line one and it runs line one. You see two, line two, it runs line two. You see line three, it runs line three. And so you can always assume that if you want a particular variable to be available at line 20, just make sure it's set lines one through 19, ready to go. The moment you have asynchronous code, which is a Ajax is asynchronous. The A in Ajax is asynchronous. The other A is and, which is like, okay. Um, so what you're saying is um, line 15 is gonna send a request to somewhere else, usually an API or something like that. And then everything else is gonna keep going while this is waiting. And the benefit of that is everything's moving a lot faster. We're not sitting here waiting for meetups, really slow servers to spit data back to us before we can do anything. But it means what if line 25 needs the results of that data? For example, what if I did this? You know, something like that. And then this, instead of doing scope.events, I'd be like, you know, awesome result. And then down here, I'm like, okay, now I want to set this to be awesome result. God bless you. It's not gonna work because when this runs, this might not be done yet because it's asynchronous, which means everything else keeps going. So you have to do things as callbacks or promises, which basically says, rather than setting all that stuff in line, you, you tell the call, which is like the thing saying, hey, go get this data. Don't run these additional things until you get the data back. So you might have seen callbacks in jQuery or you might see these things, which are promises, which is basically saying, once this is done, do this. And some promises are like, once this fails, do this, or once this succeeds, do this, or always do this. Is that code or code? What's that? Is that code or code? No, this is JavaScript, Angular. Where did you get the promises? It's part of the, the, their HTTP thing, yeah. It, ES6, which is like the newest version of JavaScript, is gonna have it, and you can also get promises through jQuery or some different libraries available to you, but this one is a uh, HTTP module available through Angular, so. Uh, that was is it really good? Yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah, I'll check it out. But it's, I'm sure it's exactly what you're used to because they're standardizing more and more. And ES6 is actually JavaScript. It's not a framework, it's the next version of JavaScript. So now that they've got promises in there, that means everybody's gonna move more and more towards that because if it's gonna be native in JavaScript soon, why would you do anything different than that? So that's not gonna work because it's asynchronous. So instead, we set it to be something dumb up top because if, if, we, if we wanted, we could actually set data in here and we'd see it for a flash just before the API came in. Let's just set it to be nothing. And we might even do something like in the template, we could say, if event is empty, then show loading. And then it would show loading until event gets filled and then loading would go away or something like that. But now we've got this and it passes in, it sets events to be this once it comes in. And so we've got this. So we're, we're now on the event controller. We want it to be a little bit different. So we want it to be meetup slash events slash. We need to be able to pass in, um, I think it's state params dot event ID. So remember we're, we're injecting things up here. State params is one of them. It's telling us what are the parameters that are available to us in this particular request based on the HTTP request, the URL, all this kind of stuff. And so one of those that we passed in, because remember we looked at app.js and we said the URL should be slash event slash a variable named event ID. And so since we're doing slash event slash the ID of this, it's gonna pass that in as a state param named event ID. So in here I say state params out of NID. So now I'm creating a URL that is meetup.superfriends.co slash meetup, API slash meetup slash events slash one, two, three, four, five, six. Hits that, comes back, gets the result. And I actually think that its result is formed a little different. I don't think it's dot results. So let's just take a look at it real quick and see what it is. So I'm gonna go to that page. Oh, HTTP is not defined because I didn't inject it. Try running again. Okay, and in our console, we're gonna see this is our, H, this is our actual result here. So when I go to data, that's it. So there's no going through multiples, it's only a single result. So what I want is response.data. So I say scope.event equals response.data, and that's it. Okay, so we're back in that same spot. Um, but I did just remember that our event template isn't actually doing anything. So rather than event, let's do, um, I think they have name, that's what it is. Nope. 
Is it event.name maybe? Yeah. And there we go. We're on our event page and we actually see the title there. Go ahead. So um, in where you do the uh, page access, um, there must be like some sort of binding happening then. Because, yeah. Uh, otherwise. It would just happen uh, once and then, yeah. So with. I'm not familiar with Angular, so I don't know if that's a. Yeah, no, it, it is a thing. Um, and I was going to skip over it, but it's a great question. So. Um, one of the things that these frameworks, uh, Knockout, Am Angular, Ember, or anything like that provide is data binding. And what it basically means is normally what we're used to is the DOMs, so your HTML code, is the absolute place where your data is represented. If it says the name of the, 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 um, the meetup in the DOM, when you want to get it later, you're probably going to go into the DOM and say get h1.name, pull it in, that's the, that's the canonical place. With these, it's reverse. Everything lives in your JavaScript. There's JavaScript objects representing it, and then you bind those things to things in the DOM. So you say, whatever is in this DOM, I, it's dumb, it's just a template. Bind it up to this piece in the scope, this particular piece of data, so that every time this changes, it changes there. And it's two-way data binding, so if it's an input that can be changed by the user, every time it changes there, update this. And the cool thing about that is you could bind 25 things in the DOM and the calculations and APIs, or whatever, all of the same singular piece of data. User changes it once and instantly it's synced across all those 25 places without you needing to worry about it. You just say how the data binding go and that's it. But because of that, it could slow things down if everything was always bound to everything else. So you need to sometimes intentionally define, I want this to bind. Otherwise, sometimes it can spit out a template, but then never bind it. And so uh, I'm not an Angular guru. If you guys remember, I learned Angular for the first time like two months ago at this meetup. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I remember that anything that is set specifically on the scope is instantly bound. There's other ways to bind things, um, but that is one of the main ones. There's another one here where we're going to do ng bind HTML. So one thing that you guys might run into with Angular is that if you try and do this, event.description, um, it's going to um, take strip all the HTML out. Um, and that's going to cause you trouble sometimes. And so sometimes you can say, I want to bind it as HTML. And so you can use these handlebars brackets, but you can also say, I, I could have instead said ng bind, oops, bind equals event.name, and it would have done the same thing. And ng bind HTML is just a special version of ng bind that allows you to have HTML in it. So we do this, and now we've got our meetup with the different information into it. So at this point, oh, that menu's wrong. So let's go change our menu. Um, let's name it nav, and let's get rid of login and search and browse. Let's just have a single one that's named menus, or events. Events, events, done. So we've got our left rail, and so we've got events. So now we've got a list of all our events. We tap in a single event, gives us the details for this event. So now, Let's go to Ionic Emulate iOS. It's going to do all of its magic. Spit it up in the iOS simulator. We actually have an iOS app phone working here showing us what it's going to look like. And so if I had an Android device here, um, I could plug it in and I could walk around and show you this exact app working on the Wi-Fi of this network and you'd actually be able to tap through them. Um, if I had test flight up and running, I could send it up to my Xcode, I could spit it out to test flight and it could send to all of your test flight accounts if we want to have something like that up and running. So in the span of less than an hour, you guys learned Ionic and we actually built an app that is actually consuming real API data that you could actually install on people's phones today. So there's lots of other cool stuff I can show you but I'll take that as a sign that it's time to be done. Um, <laughs> so heart. just a couple minutes and then I'll be done. Do you guys have any questions? Do you, uh, yeah, any questions? This is still HTML, right? This is, well, this is based on HTML and then it's wrapped in, do you know what a web view is? So a web view is, uh, the most common opportunity for you to see a web view in iOS app is if you're in Tweetbot or Twitter or whatever and somebody has a link to an interesting article and you tap that article and instead of opening that article in Safari and spitting you out, it's got this little view within it. This is all based on those. So you, you still are in the phone, but the phone basically just spins up a web view and then it delivers the resources from the packaged app. What's the difference if uh, instead of this, all you had was uh, uh, your website and uh, it had like a mobile friendly... Yeah, so there's a couple pieces of it. No, it's not equivalent. Um, it's similar. And I actually run um, a, a SaaS, a so software as a service, where that's all I offer. I say I have an extremely mobile, fr mobile, mobile friendly thing. And I'll actually show you some of the limitations of it, um, if I can get it to be the right size on the screen. Um, yeah, I can't actually even. 
wait, there we go, okay. So I, I tell people, and they're always like, well, why don't you have an app? And I'm like, look, I build a mobile-friendly website. You're going to be fine. It's going to be really cool. And you can navigate it just fine, right? So some of the limitations. First of all, I've got the browser Chrome here. I don't, I don't have control over what goes at the top here. So they're always going to see this. They're always going to see the URL. They're going to use back and forward buttons. Um, another thing is that I can't cache my images. So it's really fast here, but sometimes, and I don't have many images for this reason, but sometimes you actually like have to deal with the process of waiting for all your images to load and they see it. That's not really that good. You have control over how those things are going to load more in an Ionic app than you do elsewhere. Also, I have to tell them, well, you should put it on your home screen so you don't have to open up Safari, type Karani app every time, everything, right? So I tell them, well, what do you do? Well, you've got a bookmark it, and you got to hide your home screen, and then it's not really going to be and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, no, I don't want to deal with it. So they just end up not doing it. Um, go to the App Store. It's not in the App Store. A lot of the, so, so the, I think there's two pieces. One of them is functionality and one of them is convention. Um, the convention is they're used to going to the App Store, getting an app and having it download. So I, I could theoretically literally just wrap this website right here in a web view and deliver it, yeah, exactly. but Apple doesn't like that. But you could do, you could do as, much of that, as much reuse as you can by using Cordova and just throwing Ionic out the window. You could take this do some tweaking, get it running on Cordova, package it, and you'll be a little bit better off than if you were to just open up Xcode and say, go view karaniapp.com, whatever. Apple doesn't like that very much. They let it through, but mainly only for the big companies. But there's also some functionality that's being offered here. Remember when we looked at that list of uh, features that we have offered to us through Cordova, let's pull this up full screen. We have access to all this information on the device. So even if you don't want to use it right away, if you're willing to do a little bit of work up front to build it, you one day can change the status bar. You can vibrate. You can read. You can pull up their camera, all that kind of stuff. The majority of things you, you kind of can do um, if, you've got an I, if you're sure they're going to have an iOS device, and then you can probably do it with a specific WebKit prefix or whatever. But like, what if they're on Fire OS, and all of a sudden you get as Amazon as a client, and they, they have to have Fire OS? you're not going to be able to keep all those things on top. So it's the same kind of thing as like writing in JavaScript versus jQuery. You could do most, not all, you could do most of the stuff that like the average website would need without relying on something like this, but the user experience is never going to be as good because you're going to require them to do more manual work and you're never going to have quite the same level of functionality and the moment you need to spit out to anything different, you're screwed because you have to do it all over from scratch. So it's not like there's not a good reason for this, but these things are making it easier to do that kind of cross-browser compatibility. Are there any, uh um, there are apps. Um, I got a list and I don't have it in front of me. If you go to Ionic's website, they've got a couple dummy ones, but none of the ones that are actually big names. We found five or ten big names. Ionic is very fresh. Um, it's very new. Cordova and PhoneGap have been around. They have been, like PhoneGap is the standard. If you want to make an iOS app and you want, or any mobile app, de develop it, they're the guys who made it. They made it. They own it. Um, so there's thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of uh, Cordova and Phonic based apps. But Ionic is brand new, it's still in the beta. So they've got a single app that you can check out. Um, there's, there's a couple that are in the app store. I'll try and send you guys a link out to them later. We researched and there's a couple of them, but it's, this is still pretty fresh. So, other questions? Yeah. What's that? Sorry, do you know what version of Cordova? Um, I don't know if it actually defines it. I think it might just use the version that NPM installed. So, yeah, it's the globally in, um, installed version. So I haven't had 3.4.1, but it could be different depending on what your install is. So there may be a level of restrictions. I mean, Cordova, let's see. Uh, since it's globally installed, I don't think it's going to be, yeah, it's not defined in here. Um, but. It's, it's using, because remember, the first thing we did was we globally installed Cordova and Ionic parallel to each other. So it's not as a dependency, it's actually a parallel global app. Right. So. Whenever we get the thing published up to YouTube, we'll put that up too. We yeah. need to create a channel or something.